Another myth we see is that students have to be observed 24 seven to be safe. We, our community is supervised within the community. It's not just adult eyes on children maintaining safety. Kids do maintain safety when they're given it and, and awarded the freedoms themselves. So we have found that our students, they, they still keep themselves and others safe. They still um, are happy and, and play and enjoy their day, even though they aren't adult supervised all day. So yeah, that's a huge myth that we also see. Um, this is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Berg. All right, hello and welcome. This is Don with the uh, Agentic Schools Vodcast. I'm here with Astral Jackson of the Arts and Ideas Sudbury School in Baltimore, Maryland in the USA. Um, welcome, Astral. Thank you. Very excited to be here. Uh, <laughs> let's kick off. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> let's kick off with um, just tell me a story about someone who really took advantage of what Arts and Ideas Sudbury has to offer. Someone who really uh, kind of got great value out of what the school has to offer that can look like any number of things but my first go-to is uh, a student that we actually got later on in life um, i believe when she enrolled it was one of our recent graduates i believe when she enrolled she was around 15 and was just beat down from public school was over all of the journey that she had had with education so far and she was she had founded the school herself and convinced her parents to let her go here and she was so hungry i, I don't think i've ever seen a student that hungry to just be themselves unabashedly in community um, she got started in just about everything she could she really hit the ground running um, and we see success uh, like that from students who really want to be here and really want that freedom themselves. Um, we can see it as early as five and we can see it as late as the teenage years um, after you've already been through other forms of education. So success can look like many different things, but I think from the entry, um, just a student want, who wants to be here is one of the most valuable um, times that they get out of this school. Yeah, that, that's an interesting thing. So in your admissions process, do you do like a trial week kind of thing? Or what's what's the kind of, how do you ensure that, that this is really a match for, for the kids that you're seeing? That's a great question. And we have a quite extensive admissions process. I am one of the admissions clerks, so I'm, it's great that you asked that. Um, it starts by them sending an email of inquiry to the school saying, hey, I'd like to schedule an interview. Um, I then send them a ton of information um, on the research, on articles that they can read, videos that they can watch, really information about the Sudbury model of education because it's so different. Um, and it's one that involves no classes, no grades, no testing. It's very, very different than most forms of education that people have seen. So we send them all of the research first before we schedule an interview just to make sure that they understand what they're getting involved in. Then we have them schedule an interview and physically come into the school. I give them a tour first while school is in session so they can see the things that kids are really engaged and involved in. They can see what the layout of our building looks like and different resources that we have available to kids. Um, and then we sit down and have a chat after the tour. Um, and the chat is, it's, it's as an interview, but it really is just us um, getting to know each other and seeing if it would be a good fit, 
seeing where they're coming from, seeing why they're thinking of choosing a model like ours, feeling out where the child is as far as their readiness for school here. Um, and then it, if all goes well, they still like the fact that there is no math uh, formerly taught typically um, and no science typically and things like that. Um, once they can really understand what we do here, mm -hmm. we then schedule them in for a visiting week. And that is a real opportunity for the child to come in and act like one of our students to see if they would be a good fit. For the most part, mm -hmm. our school has quite an extensive structure set up. Um, so kids have to observe 30 minutes of our judicial committee. That's very important for them um, mm. to sort of osmosis in how it how it works and how rule breaking happens um, and, and what happens subsequently from that. And uh, they have to observe 45 minutes of our school meeting, which is where all of the democracy happens. Mm. It's really the the meat and potatoes of all the voting that we do. Um, happens at school meetings, so they've got to observe 45 minutes of that. And then there are other things like um, Monday morning announcements that's just our way of touching base at the beginning of the week as to what we plan on scheduling throughout the week, if anything. Um, so yeah, they have to do a so certain number of things, but not, not too high of a demand. Um, then once that week is right, completed, right. we meet on Friday to um, assess how the week went, talk it over, um, how feelings were throughout the week, and they can immediately enroll if it's before March. If it's after March, then they have to wait mm. until the following year to enroll. Interesting, interesting. And and um, so do you, does your school year go into June or is it? In May, in May. It does. It, it ends. Year? I believe our last day of school is June seventh this year. Okay. So it's the okay. very beginning of June. So, so you have. Yeah, yeah. Um, now I know um, every state has different requirements to prove that kids are attending. Um, what's what's kind of the minimum? Is is there a certain number of hours? Is it a sign in? Is it, how how does how do you ensure that kids are actually legally attending the school <laughs> no that's a great question um the hours of our school are 8 15 to 5 45 students can do all of or some of if they'd like we require core hours that everyone are required to be here from 11 to 3 and uh five uh, okay. hours of a minimum requirement so because 11 to 3 is not a full five hours they either have to show up a little bit earlier or stay a little bit later depending on what time they arrive but we do require everyone okay. to be here by at least 11. okay Interesting. we also yeah. are so, a so religiously exempt school so we uh okay. we don't have as many requirements in maryland as some other schools do yeah 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 and that's what it you know, I remember, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff about the original Sudbury. So um, th they have a certain hour requirement thing. So they have a certain sign in, uh, you know, it, it just varies from state to state. So um, yeah. and, and one thing since we before we move on from sort of admissions, uh, I want to really uh, admire the uh, video that you have your virtual open house because it was fantastically done. Um, and, and I will link it in the description for this because it, it, it was so good. Um, I'm glad it, you think uh, so. We yeah. worked hard on anyway. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it shows. It shows. It, it really uh, giving a sense of, of the space and, and, and a real robust explanation of, of what you're doing. So I, I really, you know, well done. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so... Um, Another thing I, I, I want to explore is, is the, the justice system. Um, and, and so I know that I've talked to a number of, of people who operate in schools, and, and I haven't actually uh, been involved with a Sudbury school, um, but I have been in free schools of other kinds, so, uh, or, or democratic schools, better term. Um, and so give us a sense of, of kind of how the justice system uh, if that's the right term for it, even uh, mm -hmm. how your kind of mediation and conflict resolution uh, works. We have, um, we like to think of them as community restorative practices. Um, so we mm -hmm. have what's called judicial committee, and that is our main driving force of uh, how rule breaking is handled or what happens from rule breaking. Um, first off, it's important to mention that we have over 300 rules 
They were all designed from our community, by our community. They are all individually voted upon. Everyone is crafted um, in school meeting and has been since our origination. So we started with no rules, ended up with 300 some from problem solving in JC. Um, so that's how rules are established first off. So then um, we have what's called uh, JC report forms that the judicial committee mm. hears every day if there are some um we change the language of those to be uh less a little bit less reflective of the court system than they once were they used mm. to have plaintiff defendant guilty not guilty on them and we felt uh -huh. as though that was triggering to some of our students unnecessarily so we changed them um objectively now to reporter subject um, and what rule you feel like was broken and purely the definition of what happened our description rather of what happened. So it's very objective um, and just writing down a JC report once you feel as though someone wronged you or broke a rule is very cathartic to our students. So that's where a lot of the rest restoration comes into play. Um, there is just writing it down, knowing that your community community will handle it and not having to worry about it. Um, but we do have a judicial mm. committee. It works like jury duty almost and how you have to serve on it. Mm. I believe it's uh, two weeks a year. Um, everyone has to serve no matter of age. And we all have one vote, which is equal, like staff vote isn't, uh, doesn't take precedent or, or more weighing over a student vote. They're all the same. Um, and it's just, uh, we have a JC clerk that's a voted on position. It's a student led position primarily. Um, so that's the acting judge that sits at the table. And then you have everyone sitting around. You have a scribe that writes and takes, takes notes on what happens during the cases. Um, and then everyone talks about them. And once they talk about them, they then vote on the findings so that they all agree on what happened. Once uh, what has happened is um, has been parsed through or gone through, um, we then talk about what are possible uh, consequences or things that a student would have to do to give back to your community as a result from breaking rules. Usually that looks like um, going and helping Caroline out in the garden, or if you make a mess, you've got to clean it up. Things that just common sense make sense. Um, sometimes it can be if you were found to have done something more harsh in an area, you could be banned from that area, um, or you would have to give back in some other way. So we really try to keep the things, um, that are, uh, happen as, as, um, as not punishment in that way. They shouldn't feel too weighted. It should mm -hmm. never be at saying sorry or imposing upon that way. Mm -hmm. Um, it should also, it should always feel like you're giving back to your community restoratively. So if something mm. is more of an interpersonal communication um, issue, it can be had in mediation. So mediation is something that we also um, have available for our students. It's not as widely used as JC. Um, JC is a daily occurrence and mediation is only sometimes if parties agree. Um, but that is available also that we have for our students if they choose. Right on. And is that mediators, uh, is that uh, adult mediators or is it also kid mediators? How does that? It's also students. Um, it's it's Look. people that have signed up as, as mediators in our program. So we had um, um, community mediators come in and sort of teach us how to do it educate us on what mediation mm. looks like for us to be able to duplicate it. So it was people that signed up in that process. That's how a lot of things work yeah. in our community. It's just a sign up basis. Um, so if you're interested in something, you have the ability to sign up all the way from maintaining our building to hiring our staff. <laughs> yep. Okay, cool. Very cool. So um, the other thing is the, the other central thing is meetings. And so um, you said, you know, the kids have to, uh, prospective students have to observe a certain amount of the meeting. Uh, is, tell me about how meetings, how, how meetings work. Meetings can happen impromptu. They just pop up based on two people interested in a thing at that moment, or they can be something that is pre-planned. We have a sort of structure of how things work as far as self-directed education. So you can 
be totally self-directed on your own and be, let's say, making cakes was the example. So if you wanted to make a cake, you could be totally coming in on your own with your own supplies, knowing how to use an oven, making cakes safely on your own. If you wanted other people, that's when meetings are, are proposed or brought into question. So if you wanted other people, we have clubs, corporations, and clerkships. So let's say making cakes is the example. You could have you and I, for example, if we're community members, in here making cakes on any given day, so long as we both don't need resources and know how to use things safely. Um, we then could just be using the kitchen freely, making cakes. That could be called cake club. So a club is are things that don't typically need resources or a budget or rules associated with them. But let's say another student wants to join and they haven't used an oven before and they don't have the proper resources to be able to make the cakes, so they need a budget. They then would have to go to school meeting, form Cake Corporation. Cake Corporation then gets rules and a budget associated with them. So then a corporation is able to be awarded money to go buy the cakes with. You could have rules as to how to use an oven safely, things along that line. So once we have a corporation, we can say, get, let's say, we make a motion for $200 for supplies for making cakes throughout the year. If that motion passes, then we are awarded the $200. We then have money to go buy cakes. Let's say Cake Corporation is thriving so much that we start selling cakes to the at-large community, people outside of our community. Then we have a cake clerkship. It's sort of what I do with admissions is perspective talking to families because I'm dealing with people outside of the community. So it's a little bit more responsibility than, let's say, a club or a corporation. Usually these are staff held positions, but they can also be student led, too. I know myself, I was hired by students. They were sending me the emails and everything that I was communicating directly with students that hired me. So you could also have students in these roles, but let's say you're selling cakes to the at-large community. You're then representing the community and you've got cake clerkship. So that's a little bit about mm -hmm. how the meeting structure can break down. Once you have one of these other structures in place, you don't have to have a structure right. in place. Like I said, you could be totally self-directed calling meetings whenever you wanted or you can have a corporation like, let's say, Kitchen Corporation that has been one of ours, that has been a longstanding corporation. You could have one of those already in place, already functioning, relatively moving from year to year, stable, and they have regular meetings that can be held as far as maintaining the kitchen, as far mm -hmm. as new members joining, as far as putting on events such as Hot Lunch Fridays. Mm -hmm. It really matters what the group wants to involve, whether they want it to be mm -hmm. selling mm -hmm. something or a school-wide thing or putting on an event or creating something, you would likely need more meetings associated with that. And anyone relatively can call meetings that's in these corporations. So that's a bit of how it works. Nice. <laughs> so that's the, the kind of day-to-day -day running the student interest driven kind of thing. But there's also another level of meeting at our subway, I think it's called all school meeting. What, how does that level work? So school meeting is every Tuesday at 1115 for us. So it happens once a week and it mm -hmm. is, it works like judicial committee in the sense that we have a school meeting team that is randomly assigned and they have to then appoint a school meeting. And then anybody else that wants to come and vote on matters can and would be counted towards that. So school meeting is other than the team, anyone that mm -hmm. wants to attend can come and talk about any of the issues that are on the agenda for that day. But that is a regular meeting that happens mm -hmm. alongside judicial committee. Judicial committee is every day if there are um, cases and then school meeting is once a week mm -hmm. if there is an agenda or things to talk okay. about, which there usually is. <laughs> the school meeting is the rulemaking body. I guess, except for corporation, in, you know, specific interest, but that's going to be the rulemaking body that most of those 300 are probably in from all school meetings. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. That's okay. one of the primary okay. functions then, of school meeting is creating rules and, and deleting yeah. rules or changing rules. Cause that's a very important process of the mm -hmm. rule 
maintaining as well is if we feel like rules are no longer serving us or they're old rules maybe that were rolled over from last year, they they might get deleted or altered. There's one more kind of meeting and that's who's handling the legal and you know the the hiring well not the hiring fine because I know that's part of the thing but but you know handling payroll handling you know making sure the bills get paid that sort of uh, level of stuff. Those are all clerkships that um, staff maintain. We have a building and grounds clerk that maintain, maintains building and grounds. We've got admissions clerks that maintains admissions, PR and inreach clerks. We've got a clerkship for just about everything, and those are all divided among yeah. staff. We've got five staff currently. We just hired our fifth one. And so, yeah, all of those type of things are divided among staff, and then we maintain them as per our clerkship. What is the legal structure that the state of state of Maryland interacts with? Sometimes it works by way of Arcadian Fellowship. So we've formed a church. The church's mission statement is freedom for democratic education for kids ages 5 to 18. It is not religiously oriented other than that. Right. And it's essentially the um, overarching domain over top of the school that sort of maintains all of our legality and things. I myself am not a person that maintains that, (laughs) thank goodness. But there are people, we we do have a board and we have meetings regularly that's associated with things like that. I know at the Village Free School, so I'm I'm near Portland, Oregon, which is where Village Free School is. They wanted to have kids on their official legal board, but there were, you know, restrictions in state law that prevented that. And so, so what they did was they had sort of created, you know, the legal board, and then they had all school meeting. Do you have uh, the ability to put under 18 year olds on your board uh, and, 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 and handle those clerkships? I'm not sure as far as our board, but I do know that we also have Mm. a voting structure called assembly that's made up of parents Mm. too. So assembly handles our more important, well, maybe not more important, but our arguably important structures of the school, such as how much the tuition is, what happened as far as our COVID protocols and keeping families safe, things like that, our annual budget every year and how money is spent Mm -hmm. is assembly. So assembly is made up of the overarching community. So parents, sometimes grandparents, but usually it's just parents and the the day-to-day, so students and and staff. So assembly um, meets roughly two times a year, and they're the ones that handle bigger decisions like that. They handled um, where our building was going to be located and what we were paying as far as a mortgage. It's it's all the bigger things like that. Right on, right on. One of the things that has famously been about, you know, famously in this in this community, Sudbury is some rhetoric around parent involvement that says parents should be at a distance in a way. What's the sensibility at, at Arts and Ideas Sudbury regarding parents? Parents are almost paying us to not know what their kids are doing. We find ah. that students <laughs> really thrive when they are separated from the self that their parents know. Their strengths mm-hmm. and who they are really can arise out of them once they have that privacy. So we really do maintain quite the wall amongst what, what kids do here at school and parents. There are times, though, where parents can be utilized, field trips, possible events that we have. We have an event called Talkabouts that happen roughly two times a year, and those are all parent-focused so that parents can come and eat some of our delicious chili made by Caroline and talk about their anxieties and their experiences at the school. So we do have a lot of support for parents in that sense social media accounts, ways that they can get connected that Mm -hmm. aren't necessarily being at school and knowing what their kids are doing. But we do find that that wall is very important for kids to be themselves. So we do try to maintain that as much as possible. Parents don't know what happens as far as day to day. They're not involved in judicial cases. We don't pull them aside and say, hey, your kid left their shoes behind today or anything like that. (laughs) And I can't hear anything. Oh, there (laughs) <laughs> I think it caught back up now. 
so so um i i lost you a little bit so yeah <laughs> um <clears throat> so do you do your staff have kids at the school some of your staff <laughs> some of them do um, me, myself, I have a two-year-old, so he's not quite old enough to join the school yet, but once he is, he will. Um, we have <laughs> uh, Caroline's, her kids have graduated already from the school, um, so they're sort of our success stories, if you will. Um, uh, James, our mathematician, um, he has mm. a daughter in the model, and then Josh, one of our other staff, has a uh, two kids almost his, his second kid is about to start in the model um i believe uh his one kid is around nine and his second is about to start soon after a brief interruption where did i so, lose you so you were talking about um a <laughs> uh, uh, different staff have different kids um i didn't get a bunch of it uh, i know you have a two-year-old uh and and somebody I have has a, a couple but i i our, our founders' kids have graduated already. Um, one okay. of them graduated and is now at Peabody, the school for music, and is doing very, very well. So he's one of our success stories. Um, and then mm -hmm. uh, two other staff currently have uh, sort of like preteens almost in the model. One of them is okay. nine, yep. um, but is going on 13. <laughs> um, so one, and yeah. he's about <laughs> to start his second kid in the model. Um, and then uh, uh, James, our mathematician, um, mm. he's got another student uh, that's a preteen in the model. So, yeah, we've got quite a few. Um, our most recent staff right on, hire right doesn't have kids yet. Yeah, one of the yet. things I... <laughs> uh, I can hear you. Oh. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I think it's caught back up. At the end there. <laughs> um, so, so, um, one of the things that came up uh, in another interview was um, not at a at a it is a, a school in Australia um, that's not Sudbury or it's democratic, I believe, but not not uh, not any given. You know, identity, but they were saying how one of the people I was interviewing was saying that she had to learn how to be staff, not just mom. Um, oh, and, yes. And, and sort of, you know, really take on that distinction and be clear about it, which, which she felt actually made her a better parent. I went through that in reverse. I became a staff member before mm. I had children. And it really helped me in my parenting and understanding how to be a parent. But I, I mean, mm. being a staff is one of the hardest jobs I've ever had. There's no boss. There's no one telling you how <laughs> to do this. It's only what has right, happened right. before and what you feel as though you can bring to the table. So it is the most rewarding job I've ever had. Definitely the best job I've ever had, but it is the mm. hardest job I've ever had because of that, having to learn how to be a staff right and it, it fights a lot of what is natural for us to be intervening in, in what kids are doing and making sure that everything is constantly as we're used to it and all of that. You have to fight that authoritative nature of yourself to micromanage everything. Right. Um, so it can be really challenging. I know myself, I came from a law firm, so I am used to the total opposite of rigidity. Um, so it was mm. very freeing to be able to come to something so welcoming and open and transparent. Um, right. So yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So so that's one of the things that that's interesting. Now, with the Sudbury model, where everyone can be involved in hiring, what are you looking for as as a school in staff? Like, what is it that? Because it's obviously not going to be teacher qualifications. In fact, some people think that's disqualifying. But yeah, how do you go about making that decision in 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 the school? Just recently, we did our hiring, so that's actually perfect to talk about. We wanted someone that had an understanding of the model, at least a little bit, to be able to build upon that, and that was willing to continue doing research once they were hired. 
just because of how mm-hmm. different what we do here. We, it, if we had to really start from scratch and have to explain that to someone, it could be challenging. So we had, when we were doing the process, we had a hiring committee and the committee was made up of mm-hmm. staff and students. So the staff sort of helped maintain the integrity of what we were looking for as far as legality, making sure they could pass background checks, making sure they've worked with students before, things along those lines. But we were really looking for someone that was standalone, that could stand on their own two feet, that uh, could speak for themselves, that was driven, that wanted to step in and, and get engaged in things, and that was really hungry for a community. So the person that we found totally fulfilled that she mm-hmm. was a local artist. So it was kind of cool seeing what she could bring to the table too, such as butter sculptures. Like that wasn't something we were thinking we were looking for, but it was cool to find. So it's definitely someone who's unique. Also, they fit into our community well. Right on, right on. The other thing is, is like you said, it's a self-directed community on both sides, the adults and children. And so figuring out your place is a challenge. That's something I've observed in other free schools. Uh, I actually worked at the village free school for for a year. So like they had interns that would come for a certain amount of time and, Mm -hmm. and the interns would have a really hard time figuring out, you know, what to do, (laughs) you know, how to, how to Mm -hmm. be a value in the community. We have one of those currently. Um, He's been slotting in great. He's, he's been, a real blessing, I feel like, in the community as far as figuring out what to do. He has sort of stepped in right mm. now. He's working on a project that he just, he he took a lengthy walk there around the school, noticed that outside there was a fish tank that our chickens were preoccupying, but wasn't really used. So he's like, hey, I'm going to set up this fish tank. Mm. It It really, the measures of success of adults in our community is that they're driven and that they are wanting to get involved in stuff. So, and, and wanting students to, to get involved in stuff. It doesn't have to be compelling. And essentially if no one was interested, then he might not do it. Um, so it can be a real test of ego, right, right. but just putting yourself out there is, is an important part, I think, to it. He wanted to see first if anyone was interested, so he went to school meeting and started a discussion around starting a fish tank, and it turns out people were interested, so then he took off on that. Um, So that's sort of how things work also. After a brief interruption. It left off, you were talking about the fish tank being established. Right. So one of the most important lessons that staff or adults in the model go through is what ego hits look like. And that kids don't want to learn from us just because we're adults. They don't want to learn from us just because we're extraordinary. And that's okay. And we need to be okay with that. And I Mm -hmm. think a lot of adults have a hard time with that because they feel as though we're adults, so that sets us apart from kids, but it really doesn't. Kids are fine, self-directed and doing their own thing, and oftentimes what they want to do is doing their own thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So just on a side note, I'm going to put it on something called low data mode, and so we may just do audio instead of video so that we can keep the connection live, see what happens. Okay. Um, it's still recording, <laughs> but you know, we're going <laughs> to manage it here. Um, so, so uh, one, one, just just uh, to to tail on the the fish tank thing is that one of the things. While uh, when I first got uh, involved with Village Free School, this was two thousand nine or so. Um, they actually had a fish. They even had an octopus in their fish tank. Uh, That's so it was cool. Pretty uh, special fish tank. That's our mascot. Up. Yeah, yeah, they, they, um, oh, really? Nice. <laughs> yeah, we should consider getting yeah, an octopus. The, uh, they didn't keep that. it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it, octopus are very intelligent creatures. And so they, you know, you really have to have somebody committed to, you know, interacting <laughs> with it and, and ensuring its health because it's a really, you know, they're, they're an incredible species. Plus, they're notorious for, uh, getting out of their enclosures so <laughs> yeah i've um, heard <laughs> uh, 
yeah yeah it's pretty neat um so so one of the things that that um is is I, I, it is always interesting to explore is what are the kinds of resources and opportunities that you, that your school uh, makes available or that has made available because kids were asking for it that are not typically available in other types of school, more mainstream types of schools? That's a great question. Our resources sort of come from a variety of things. They come from people being interested in things, and they also come from things that are sent to us that, as staff, we think look interesting. Um, so a lot of them could be schooly, like field trips. I know we're taking a field trip to go and see Romeo and Juliet on April 3rd. So there are some things that are schooly, but then there are also the field trips like a community-wide camping trip that involves like three days of camping with your friends without that mm. many chaperones and staff members and things like that. So that might be something unique. We also have a school-wide sleepover that happens mm -hmm. that I know is unusual to most schools. We have field trips that are unusual as well. Like occasionally there will be ones going to Herring Run Park and looking at things like a dead deer or like glass that has been left on the ground and things like that. Um, so they're interesting mm -hmm. field trips, I would say, is one of them. We also have the resources for everyone to access screens should they need or want. So we don't want people arguing over screens or if they don't have enough money for one themselves not right. to be able to utilize the screen because of that. So we make sure that all of our community members have access to devices and screens, should that be something that they want to engage in, because we don't limit screen time. Um, so that's something definitely unusual from other schools. I know screen time is a big factor for a lot of people, so it can be a point of contention, but it is something that we don't limit. Things along those lines that are really kid-friendly. Kids have the ability to go outside and play all day as a resource. That's something kind of unheard of at other models of education, especially public right, right. school. So yeah, they, they have the ability to self-select in their day, which can be a resource of their own, especially an untapped mm. one that other schools don't have. So I think those are just a few to name. Nice. Right on, right on. Um, so one of the things that, that I find interesting is that, that uh, schools that have been around as long as yours have often develop um, jargons. They, they develop <laughs> code words for certain things. Um, and, and, and it's always interesting to find out, is there a code word or, or jargon that your community uses that would be really great if, if it was more widely adopted in the world? I can think of jargon that people use of like Sudbury-esque, but we always go against right. that because all of our schools are so different that who's to say what is or isn't Sudbury-esque? So we talk about, about mm -hmm. that as jargon all the time. That, I think, is an interesting discussion just amongst people like us with noting how different our schools are and can be. Some have different structures in place as far as their voting and as far as judicial committee goes. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the question as to whether things are Sudbury-esque or not is, is jargon that is always running through my head. Not only because it's not a word, a real word, but because it just means such passion to some people. As it should, probably, as to the nature of how Sudbury their school is. But the, the commentary of that is kind of comedic to me because... There is no how Sudbury someone's school mm. is because there's no commonly widely used definition of the thing. So I think that one is, is an interesting one to me. I can think of the students have about a billion. I can't tell you what they are because mm -hmm. I'm not that cool. <laughs> but um, 
I know they used in JC the word Riz the other day, and I was trying to figure out what that word is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, these kids have a, a total language of their own sometimes that is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. We also no, have no. a room in the school called the Infotarium. And it's a word that the teenagers meant that meant room with a big TV. So there are a few <laughs> words like that, too, that are our community-centered words. Yeah, yeah, infotarium. I like that one. Yeah. Uh, sort, of, sort of gives an air of, you know, let's proceed to the infotarium. <laughs> infotarium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very cool. For um, sure. So, so uh, since you're on the admissions committee, you would also have insight into what are some of the education myths that you run into from prospective parents that may be interfering with their ability to sort of engage with, a, a, you know, this kind of different education. There are all too many to count. I can <laughs> say the notable one of the parents going, but what about math? As though their kid mm -hmm. would just flounder completely and never become an adult because they haven't had a formal math class. I will also say it's interesting because one of our staff members is a notable, has his PhD in math. So we have the ability to have mm -hmm. math classes and do sometimes that are sparsely attended, mm -hmm. but still, um, well, some, some are, some are very vastly attended, but then attendance kind of drops off. But mm -hmm. yeah, the parents that are worried about academics, it's such a myth that academics are the most important thing about education and that your child has to be a number and that they have to prove themselves in that regard. Academics could not be, they are important. I, I'll give them that, especially if what you want to do next right, is right. college or something like that. But they're so easily attained if a kid is driven to attain them. If a kid has never taken a class mm -hmm. and wants to go to college, for example, there are multiple ways by which they could go about this. And it doesn't have to be you taking SATs and you completing all of these uh, forms of coursework just to get credit for college or just to prove that you can be a valuable enough college admissions person. It, it shouldn't work like that. And it doesn't work like that, at least for us. Our kids still get into college. They still get into trade schools. They still do what they want to do after this. I think a huge driving factor of that is because they're hungry for it. They are, right. they're, they're so much more driven when, when they want to accomplish something and that causes them to be more successful than their counterparts who are just beaten down by the education system thus far. So that, that's something we notice as a myth is just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. far from, from the mainstream is okay to be. Doors aren't closed just because uh, academics weren't at the forefront. Another myth we see is that students have to be observed 24-7 to be safe. Right. We, our community is supervised within the community. It's not just adult eyes mm -hmm. on children maintaining safety. Kids do maintain safety when they're given it and, and awarded the freedoms themselves. So we have found that um, our students, they, they still keep themselves and others safe. They still um, are happy and, and play and enjoy their day, even though they aren't adult supervised all day. Um, so yeah, that's a mm -hmm, huge myth mm -hmm. that we also see. Another one is that kids are untrustworthy. I mean, that could not be farther from the truth. Kids are some mm. of the most trustworthy people if you just give them the autonomy and give them the trust. It's just a lot of adults that can't mm. fathom that. It's it's not the world that they were raised in, and it's mm. not the world that they're used to. So giving kids their freedom and their trust back is something that we find easy and rewarding, and, and is also just a total myth as far as what kids and can, can and cannot do. We have an extensive off-campus policy. Mm -hmm that gives a lot of adults pause at first when they hear about it because they're like, oh my gosh, Baltimore is so scary of a place, even though it's not. 
So our kids, if their <laughs> ages uh, out of three students, if the highest and the lowest ages add up to 20, they can go off campus and utilize the off campus policy. And we find that it works out for them. They want to maintain mm -hmm. respect. They want to maintain safety and they do. So yeah, we, we give our kids a lot of freedoms that not a lot of adults would give because of these myths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so, so the, <laughs> as long as the group's ages add up to 20, is that, did I get that right? The highest and the lowest ages have to add up to 20. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so you take two people in the group, as long as the oldest and the youngest add up to 20, then you're good. 20 or more, yep. right? Yep. 20 or more. Yep. Okay. That's that's a that, I like that rule. That's really neat. Yeah, <laughs> hadn't heard. We are like in an before. area of Baltimore uh, that's very community friendly, so it's very walkable. Um, and there are a lot of businesses mm. and coffee shops and bookstores and record stores and CVS and all of those type things on the main road. The kids love to walk to and get food at or um, buy things from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see if there's. Hmm? So. What'd you say? I think we're going to start wrapping up here. Um, okay. I like to begin and end with stories. So tell me a story about a time that the school faced a challenge or, or someone faced a challenge and the school was better after having faced this challenge. I can think of some edgier JC cases that have happened from newer students, and we've all benefited from having these conversations. So a student might come in with edgier language or bullying tendencies or things like that, and our community definitely quickly comes to the forefront as far as advocacy for LGBTQ students as far as advocacy for racial differences amongst students. We really do come together as a community in those regards and become better from that, whether they be um, talking out why the behavior was problematic in the first place, to how it affected students, to the possible negative outcomes it can have, and all of these things are a real reflection upon our community and the values that we hold. So I can think of like, we've had edgier teens come in and sort of use this edgier language and it quickly is written up by students, which is something that is proving that a system works first off by students that are new and old engaging in the JC system enough to write something up enough for us to talk about it the cases are attended by not only the team but members of the community from all of the different rooms in the school coming to the one room wanting to discuss the matter if it gets escalated to school meeting they then all come together and want to talk about whatever the topic was and how it could be harmful if it's not changed so i see things like that happen not frequently, but sometimes in our community, as far as behaviors that are challenging from new students, just brand new students. And some end up lasting in our community and some end up not making it in our community. So those are times where I feel like our community is the strongest, is all coming together, really talking about topics that are typically taboo or challenging in other schools. Um, adults might be very quick in other schools too to come in and absolve the problems and sort of sweep it under the rug and sweep it away and I think that really is at a detriment to a lot of these kids for understanding topics that might be a little edgier which is really what life is about is how to handle things that we might not be equipped to handle and it really is a beautiful thing to be able to hear and see some of these students talking about some of these things. And the things range from mental health to physical health to the way that one expresses oneself. 
So it really is cool to see kids advocating for other kids and their rights. And I think it makes us stronger as a community. Even though they're rare events, they're formative in the sense, both for individuals and kids getting feedback about their behavior um, and giving feedback about others' behavior and, and, and sort of having that conversation. It's something that, that is afforded in this type of democratic environment that is, is overshadowed in environments that are structured so differently, you know, structured around academic delivery instead of around the agency of the kids themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, so, so yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, oh, so important part before we uh, sign off. Um, where do people need to go to find out more about Arts and Ideas Sudbury in Baltimore? Please um, head to our website. It is www.aisudbury.org. Um, that is spelled A I S is in Sam, U D is in dog, B is in boy, U R Y dot org. Um, you can find a ton about our school. You can find a ton about our education model. It is one that is international. Um, not that many people mm -hmm. might know about it, um, but we want it to be worldwide. Um, everyone should be able to have access to a Sudbury school or some form of alternative education. Um, we think that playgroups are very important and kids having freedom and having their childhood back is very important. So we hope that it um, becomes more spread as time goes on. <laughs> awesome. Astral Jackson, thank you so much for your time and energy. Um, appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right.